and I just found out that a YouTuber named Jake actually just got a real human skull. So I wanted to make a candid video of me responding to him unboxing a real human skull. I'm here at the office and let's take a look. What's up and welcome back. And if this is your first time on my channel, I'm Jake. Nice it is my first you. time this, on your channel, Jake. <laughs> this, this video is gonna be crazy. Nuts. I can't wait to see Mac it. Macadamia nuts. But I'm ready, but not really. Okay, <laughs> okay, I'm not. But, uh, but I'm still gonna do it anyway. Every video that I've been putting out lately, mm -hmm. I just think that I've probably pushed the line. But I, <laughs> I guess I keep reaching a new line to push. But, but yeah, here we go. The other day, I was looking into more dark memorabilia. I was trying to find the next up thing. So there's this band oh. called Mayhem. They're a Norwegian band from the 90s. And their lead singer was definitely something else. His name was Dead. They said that he was the first performer to wear corpse paint. Which is so that's really intense. Even for me, um, when I constantly work with human bones and human osteology for a living, a lot of people say, oh, John, are you obsessed with death? And actually quite the opposite. I actually have quite a disdain for death because I feel like it's something that we all are working through and we all struggle with. So super intense start to the video. The ghoulish face paint. He would bury his clothes for days and then wear them so he'd smell like death. And before every show, he would get a bag with a dead bird in it and inhale it so death was running through his nostrils when he performed. He did all kinds of stuff like this because he was obsessed with death. One day, Jeez. he decided to slit his wrists. As he was bleeding out, he wrote a final letter. The first thing he said was, excuse the blood. After he was done writing it, he shot himself in the head. Afterwards, his bandmate found him. And the first thing he did was pull out a camera, pose him up, and take pictures of his body. So that's really intense, like super, super intense. I'm not even quite sure the legality of you could just give away your friend's skull to other people. Super interesting, but let's continue watching. I really liked it. So the reason why I'm bringing all the- Also for anyone watching and wondering why their legs dangling on, I actually have an Icarus tattoo, but it always looks awkward when just the feet are there in case anyone was wondering. Out is because I saw a band member that was gifted a skull decided to put it up for sale gotcha. online and it sold for $3,000. So I was, I recently wow. found out about this and I was researching it because I thought it was crazy. And while I was searching on Google, the first thing that came up was human schools for sale. I, I didn't even know it was legal, but it Right, so what he's talking about human skulls for sale, there were actually a variety of different sellers that provide human osteology to different people all over the world. People have different reasons for collecting. Personally, I make my bones available to everybody. And here's the thing. In the US, there's no federal regulation against the ownership, sale, or possession of human osteology. So as long as you're in all states, it's, fed it's federally legal, and it's on a state-by-state -state cases. The only state that has regulations on it are Louisiana, Georgia, and Tennessee. Louisiana, it's banned outright. Georgia and Tennessee, you can own it, but it cannot leave or come in state lines. It was like 3 a.m. and I clicked it because I was curious. And there's a bunch of human skulls. I buy, for sale. I buy human Actual skulls human for skulls. sale at 3 in the morning sometimes too, so I feel you. But in the span of about 10 minutes, I bought one. <laughs> and I don't know why. Impulse purchasing, purchasing skulls, very intense. And in the moment, I was like, oh my God, my supporters are gonna love this. It's gonna be such a cool thing to unbox. Buyer's and regret, to it's a real thing. <laughs> and then I woke up in the morning and I was like, why the f did you just do that? That is literally a person that went to middle school, mm -hmm. went to high school, had a life, had a job, maybe had kids. And now they're gone and I have their skull. And, and then I was like getting kind of scared because I, what, what am I gonna do with a skull? After I'm done with it, I can't just put it in my closet. So what he's talking about there is kind of the identity paradigm and trying to differentiate the, the individual's identity away from the skull itself. And that's the way that we try to look at skulls here at John's Bones is it's no longer about Martha. Her, it's not about Jane, it's not about John. You know, at the end of the day, this individual had donated their bodies to medical science, so it's no longer about the individual's identity, but it's more about the, the item itself. So 
normally anonymity is a huge part of the medical bone trade and anyone that says that they know whose skull this was is lying to you they do not because technically it's a breach of privacy act because their name is not medically relevant to the the skull itself so since their name and identity are, is not relevant to the medical research and the medical education that comes with it typically identity is kept completely a mystery but for first-time buyers that's something that commonly is asked because that's i feel like that's so that's so disrespectful of me to do and, and i'm not gonna right. bury it because i'm not just gonna bury it somewhere so i i, I literally was kind of panicking because i just it just felt so wrong but I decided that after I film this mm -hmm. video, I'm probably gonna send it back to the company or maybe- So talking about that, he's talking about how medical skulls were donated to science. Typically skulls originated from Calcutta, India, and they were the main distributors of skulls. Then they sent it to skeleton, skeleton manufacturer companies where they would be add, actually I can show you right here. Hinges and pieces were added all over medical skulls. This one is one from the 1920s, and then they were sold out to medical students. So once the cadaver was cleaned and skeletonized, then they would send it to individual companies for detailing. Actually, random sidetracked, Kilgore International was one of the most advanced detailers out of all of the companies, and they were known for their intricate markings and intricate cuts that they do for their real human skulls, and that's kind of how we differentiate which bones came from what company is the style of preparation. A school or something, and I'm in no way trying to disrespect anyone or anything. I'm, I'm just simply unboxing it. It was given It's not the craziest thing I've done. I've so dealt I'm with be things like this more and well. more. But think of this as a science lesson, I guess. We're going to look at a human skull. <sighs> I don't think I'm ready for this because I honestly think this is the craziest thing that I've done. They were super expensive too. Which, I mean, makes sense. I don't think it's- Right, so medical skulls are actually quite expensive and quite hard to acquire. So yes, they do come with a high price tag, but it's associated and assumed with that price tag that the skull should be treated with the utmost of dignity and respect. And they should be treated and handled as if, the way that I like to do it is, I like to try to treat these skulls as if they still had loved ones that were alive till this day. So think about it, if, if you own a skull, think, okay, maybe their son is still alive, maybe their daughter is still alive. And that has to be held with quite care. So as long as you're respectful with it, you handle it properly, you're not throwing it around like a toy, that's the best way to practice with how to respect the skull. I am so he's unboxing the skull right now. Great packing job. We love packing peanuts. All right, the box is cut open. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I guess I'm gonna take it out now. <laughs> this is for you guys, so please hit subscribe. This is, this is not for me. I do not want to do this. Spare subscribe. <sighs> Okay. Uh, he seems very, um, very ecstatic, yeah. very nervous. Um, you know, it's his first ever piece. I was like that when I got my first skull too, but I've seen and worked with thousands of skulls now. So for me, I'm not quite as squeamish and as excited as he is, but I completely understand where it comes from. Oh my God, why is it so heavy, bro? Oh my God, his mouth is deattached. Yeah, so he was talking about how the mouth was detached from the skull. So the mandible is actually held on through cartilage and through muscle. So when there's no more cartilage and no more muscle, then the, the, the mandible is no longer attached to the skull. That's why in the majority of medical skulls that you see, there's actually a hinge that allows oh the gosh, mandible to stay hands. attached to the skull. Oh my God, make sure I never but my face again in this video, please. At least it looks happy. So let's just take the teeth away. The only bones that aren't available to be purchased are Native American bones. I don't really yes. know why. So what he's talking about here is the Native American Grave and Reprimandment Act. I'm probably butchering that, but that states that the possession of any Native American remains is federally illegal. So if you ever get a skull that you suspect to be Native American, you do not want it. So that's something that we're very conscious of here at John's Bones, and that's why we have an osteologist that looks at all the skulls we get in to make sure that we're following the state laws and the correct protocol when working with human remains. But yes, that is a, a very distinct law that everyone should be aware of. Glad he brought that up in this video. But I'm assuming it's because Native Americans have their own rights because they're natives to the land. So that's my only guess, I'm not really sure. Oh my God, I didn't mean to do that. So the only information that I have on this skull is that 
it's a middle to late age male and it's European. So I hope this person lived mm -hmm. a full, beautiful life and did everything that they wanted to do. It's also, it's so crazy to think that we're just walking brains. Everything that Solid. we do, think, feel, it's all from our brain. Literally, imagine a room full of people and then just take away the bodies and it's just a room full of brains. And that's really all we are. Like, it's literally just a brain using a machine to get around. That's mm. all we are, is a brain. When I lift my arm, my brain just told me to do that and my brain will right here. So I'm gonna get my phone camera and we're gonna try to see if we can look inside of it. So here he's looking at the human skull and there appears to be some dirt or some grass in there and that's more common with archeological slash ossuary skulls. So this doesn't quite appear to be a medical skull and I primarily only specialize in the commercialized bone trade and that is only medical skulls. But typically there are three types of categorizations for skulls. There are tribal skulls, ossuary, well tribal skulls, which is broken into Dyaks, Kampalas, headhunters, and other regional um, groups that used to use headhunting as a form of religion or trophies, trophy hunting. Then there's archaeological skulls, and think about ossuary skulls like the catacombs or church skulls or plague victim skulls, or archaeological skulls that are discovered through a dig. And then finally, there's the medical skulls, and those are broken into Kilgore, Adam Ruley, Samsa, Carolina, Carolina Biological Supply, what else is there? Clay Adams, there are so many medical supply companies. So that seems to be an archaeological skull. And as I said earlier, according to the US, there are no federal regulations against the ownership, sale, and possession. Make sure to so like that and is okay. I don't know. That, I don't know that many people that would do this. And and quite frankly, I can't believe that I just did it. But that was that. I I did it. So make sure to like and. Well, that's the whole video. Um, Jake, such a pleasure. Uh, I'm so glad that you're getting into the realm of human osteology, and it's something that you were interested in taking a look at. Um, this is my everyday life. This is what I work on with a, for a living, and this is my bread and butter. So I'm so glad that you could unbox your first human skull. I definitely remember what it was like when I was a freshman in college, and I got a skull shipped to my dorm room, and all my roommates were like, what the heck? So definitely it's fantastic. I'm glad that you're getting into this industry, and I just wanted to make a video responding to your video so I can kind of answer some questions if people had it in the comments. And also, if you ever wanted to come down and look at the collection, hit me up, hit me up on my email. I'd love to collaborate with you. But I hope that was helpful and I hope you guys found this video informative and that's all I have for today. So bye-bye guys.